This is Modern Mindset, the show that picks the brains of the world's leading minds to help you unlock yours. I'm your host, Adam Cox, and joining me today, we have child therapist and director of NLP for Kids, Gemma Bailey. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Lovely to see you today. Yeah, it's fantastic to speak with you. Um, I love your blooper videos, by the way. Um, they're, they're absolutely hilarious. Um, tell us a little bit about your background, because not everyone becomes a child therapist. Not everyone sets up a company to train and kind of teach people how to do those kind of things. So what was the appeal for you and, and how did you end up in that kind of profession? Um, well, my background from what I refer to as my past life um, is that I was a nursery nurse. So I worked with children in a range of different childcare settings. Um, I worked in the NHS with the health visiting team. I was a day nursery manager. I worked as a nanny. So I had really extensive experience in working in those sectors. But there were two, I guess, key problems with it. One is that it tends to be either a very poorly paid profession or one way you can um, earn a decent living, but you're gonna be working 12, 13, 14, 15 hours a day, particularly in nannying. Um, I'd also had a real fondness during my training for the more sort of psychological, behavioral aspects of uh, working with children and, and their families. And I became a bit of a go-to person for sort of problem solving when we were having um, issues with challenging children. So when I came across NLP, um, I just thought that's really good stuff. Now, initially in the interest of transparency, I was thinking about doing a complete 360 career change and kind of dropping working with children completely. And then when I came to do my NLP trainers training, um, a lady called Kay Gill, who um, actually was like one of the sort of at the forefront of starting up NLP for kids with me back then. Um, she said, we can't all leave this training. There was maybe 40 of us on the training. She said, we can't all leave here and do the same thing. Like, we need to do something that's a bit more specialised, a bit more niche. And she said, you've got bags of experience working with children. And she had children and quite a lot of them. So it was her suggestion that we, we actually take these NLP skills and do something specifically for children and young people. And I'll be completely honest, in the beginning, I didn't want to do it because I really felt like I was leaving that, you know, that part of my life behind. But the truth is it worked and it worked really well. Um, I was already seeing clients myself by that stage, but predominantly adult clients. And as soon as I sort of put the message out there that I was gonna be doing something um, using NLP and cognitive skills with children, we got three inquiries in the first three days. So the rest, as they say, is history. Mm, absolutely. I, I love NLP. I'm a big fan of NLP. But for those listening that aren't familiar with NLP, what is it and, and how do you use it in particular with, with children? So it's a set of different uh, techniques and strategies. Some of it is quite attitudinal based. Some of it is really based around communication. So there's no one thing that kind of succinctly describes what NLP is. It kind of depends on who you're working with as to which aspects of it might be appropriate to introduce to them. So we have um, some particular processes that we use for very particular issues. For example, there is something called the fast phobia model, which is specifically used for overcoming phobias. But then there are other elements of NLP that really kind of fine tune your communication skills and help you to be able to communicate in more detail or more broadly at times or a combination of the both so that you're able to um, essentially elicit information from other people that might be useful for you in order to help them to move forward or to uh, even change the way that they're interacting with other people or quite importantly the way that we're interacting with ourselves inside our heads because we communicate in there too so with NLP for kids what became really important to me quite early on is that whilst NLP is um, like just filled with so many useful strategies actually quite a lot of the time there's steps that are quite convoluted and the linguistics around it can be really complex. So it can be quite off-putting for people to think about, well, how do I translate that 
and make it work for a seven-year-old? How's that ever going to work? So in a way, what my role was in the early days of NLP for Kids was to take everything that I'd learned about NLP, look at which processes might be useful and appropriate for children, and then think of other ways to share them with people that would almost kind of de-NLP them if they were already qualified practitioners so that they weren't kind of jumping in with their usual terminology but were using much more simple straightforward ways of communicating it and as I started to do more of that I would then work with adults using the same sort of terminology that I would use with children so it was you know just very simple and then I would have adults that said to me do you know what I learned NLP 10 years ago but do you know the way you've explained it today it's just really hit home today in a way that it never did before and i'd secretly be thinking that's because i'm pretending that you're seven <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of mirrors one of the the core presuppositions of nlp which is the purpose of your communication as a response you get so it seems <laughs> like by communicating you know in a more simple you know way it was understood better which absolutely yeah and you can always layer in more details later you know if someone's hungry for that but you know i think one of the things that we need to be conscious of doing is we're not there to for our own ego we're not there to sort of sound clever we're there to get the point across and to make it work for the person that we're working with so if we go in you know simple and uh, straightforward making it easy for someone to understand but most importantly making it easy for them to then actually put it into practice in the real world later on then they're much more likely to do it if they feel that they need to leave the session remembering things like internal representation and nominalization it's never going to stick so we want to put it in a way that's going to make them want to return to it and actually use it later on mm. and do you find some of the other presuppositions of nlp are particularly useful when thinking about children because the one that comes to mind is the map is not the territory you know yeah. the the way that children are going to represent you know let's say an argument with a friend at school could be everything to them and yet oh. it could be perceived to be nothing to a parent you know do you see things that you know if we were looking at and, and thinking actually that's really really important when you're thinking about children absolutely i think particularly as well when we're looking at things like behavior so going back to my nursery nursing days something you would see with uh, children who are toddlers is sometimes they'll go through a phase of biting and it's actually just a response to them not being able to communicate and getting frustrated and it would be very easy for, you know, if you didn't think it through properly, um, for staff to begin labeling that child as the biter or words to that effect. And then it's almost like they become the label that they've got because, you know, they start to live up to that expectation that we've got of them. So being able to separate their behavior from their intention, going back to the presuppositions, is another thing that shows up all the time when you're working with children and young people. Mm. And I guess, you know, if we're looking at DILT's logical levels, you know, they're being described at the identity level rather than their behavior, and then it's more difficult to, to shift. It's been a very strange year with, um, you know, beginning of the year, uh, we hear rumors of this kind of virus in kind of China, and then suddenly everything changes, schools get locked down. What impact, obviously it's impacted everyone, but what particular impact do you think it's had more so on children? Um, I think it's been mixed. So I would say, obviously, we see more of the problematic end of the scale. If they're coping well and doing well, we maybe don't even get to hear about those children quite so much. But from my end and speaking to parents and working with young people, um, there's certainly been heightened levels of anxiety. Now, don't get me wrong. I think, you know, we've been talking about a mental health crisis for a very long time now. Um, and that's kind of continued to almost kind of uh, bubble away in the saucepan with the lid just sort of gently bouncing around. I think what lockdown did was it really exposed more problems um, that we'd maybe been able to sort of successfully keep a lid on for all of that time up until now. So, for example, in families, you know, those children, a lot of the time were having some level of struggle, but 
lockdown put a magnifying glass on it um and because very often we're just busy you know we're busy with our lives we've got children going to school maybe doing an after school club some of them do breakfast club and after school club at the other end of the day then they may be doing swimming on a saturday and horse riding in the afternoon or whatever other sorts of wonderful opportunities are available to them then we take them on holiday during you know the half term break or they go stay with grandparents we're all really really busy and what that does is it means that we're all quite distracted from the other stuff that might kind of be whispering away in the back of our minds and when something like lockdown happens and you haven't got all of those distractions anymore is those whispers become a little louder and then it turns around to a point where okay we actually need to put some focus into resolving this now because the normal distractions aren't there um and the anxieties start to grow and you know the frustrations were there for quite a lot of our older young people um in terms of them sort of feeling that restriction on their freedom so we were seeing anger issues coming out um one of the things I haven't talked about a lot, but was definitely an issue, is the reliance that technology uh, it was created during that first lockdown. And, and I don't mean, obviously, you know, there was a lot of schooling that was happening and technology was, was supporting that in a very positive way. But there was also an awful lot of gaming going on throughout lockdown. Um, and then routines start going out of whack because then we've got, you know, teenagers staying up um, gaming and online until three o'clock in the morning and then they don't want to do their lessons the next day so there were just so many ramifications that came about because of uh, particularly that first lockdown at the start of the year mm. it's a tricky thing with the gaming because at some level that becomes you know if they can't see their friends physically that becomes a way for them to kind of 100%. connect and socialize and have that stimulation and a bit of excitement but at the same time it's difficult to kind of enforce those boundaries yes and everything's changed and they don't have to get up for school the following day what would be your advice to parents that let's say they they have a child that um it's gotten out of control let's say with gaming or screen time or digital devices what kind of tips would you give them to kind of help uh rein that in or or find a bit of balance yeah well the key word you said there was around boundaries because it you know just hooking back a little bit there was one particular family i remember speaking to um where they had that exact problem um but then the child uh had done something i don't quite remember what and so then they were going to take away all of the technology as a punishment which ordinarily i would support that but actually in this instance it's like no but that's all he's got right now you know if you take that away then you know you're gonna have a coup on your hands there's gonna be a really big problem in your household you're gonna have to find an alternative you know punishment for whatever the issue was because taking away that technology at that point in time was not going to be the way forward it, it was literally this boy's only contact with the world outside of his house so we do need boundaries there i think somewhat you need to reflect on the age of the child but I always mention as well, it's worth thinking about their stage in terms of their stage of development, because if we've got, let's say, an 11 year old who is spending too much time gaming and we want to uh, maybe make a change to the number of hours that they're investing into that, then with some 11 year olds, you can have a conversation with them about that. You can negotiate with them. You can create a plan together um, and you can get them almost feeling like a sense of responsibility and that they've got control over the situation um, and that you give them that little bit of leniency for sort of um, making the changes themselves. And I've had some really, you know, like wonderfully insightful young people that I've spoken to over the last few months. Um, one of them it wasn't gaming it was going on her phone and watching youtube and um i remember her saying to me we were talking about the amount of time she was investing and she said it's really funny i don't even really know why i do it because um I end up sitting in a funny position for a couple of hours and then afterwards my body feels really achy and I feel a bit sick because I've maybe not had anything to eat or drink for all of that time and I don't actually feel very good about what I've been doing but I know that I want to do it 
And so, you know, a lot of them have got this level of awareness whereby you can have quite a meaningful conversation with them, negotiate and put those boundaries in place between the two of you. That's always going to be a preference. However, if we have perhaps a younger child or a child who is just less mature, they're at a different stage of development where they don't see the benefits of winding it back on the amount of time that they're spending on their technology, then we have to put other measures in place. And those might be a bit more brutal. You know, one of the things I've said to parents before is, I think you need to have a power cut tonight. And I, I always remember this, this was in a school and the mum sort of went, well, what do you mean? And I went, do you know where your fuse board is? Because if you've asked five times for him to end the game and come and sit downstairs, or even if it's like, come and have dinner, and you're getting a no on that, and you've threatened to switch it off or take away the controller, and then that's been um, responded to with uh, aggression or verbal abuse or something like that, you've got to take the reins back here somehow. Do you know where your fuse board is? You need to have a power cut. The good news is when it comes to children and technology, they tend to um, kind of struggle more um, later on, you know, instantly. There may be a, a reaction, but then actually they'll be okay. And then later they'll start to struggle. It works the opposite way around with adults. So it actually during the first lockdown, um, Facebook for some reason had decided that I was only 13 years old and locked me out. And so uh, I, I could no longer get into Facebook whatsoever. And what I noticed was that even though I knew this, about four times a day, I'd still open the app and it would say, you're locked out. And I'd go, I know. And then I'd close it again. And in the end, I had to delete the app because it was like purely habitual that I was sort of doing this behavior. And it was like the first few days I was like, I can do this, it's gonna be fine, it's gonna be easy, it's not gonna be a problem. And then it just really started to set in and itch at me after a while. And then a few months after that, cause it did go on for a while, then it really changed my pattern. I eventually got Facebook back, but my relationship with it is very different now. It's like the spell got broken. Mm. So it works in a different way to adults as it, it, it to what it does um, for children when it comes to technology addiction. So Facebook became your pattern interrupt. It was. Yeah. yeah. And I guess a power cut could be that way for, for children just to kind of break them out of that kind of habitual you know, kind of nature. And I guess also enforce the boundaries if they're not being respected through communication. Yeah. Um, you mentioned aggression quite a bit there and, and kind of anger. Um, why do you think that is such a particular issue perhaps the parents face with children and how did lockdown make that worse? Um, I think in terms of the reason why it's such an issue, you know, we, we saw and still see even now that there isn't necessarily great modeling going on, particularly in reference to things like lockdown. So uh, again, going back to Facebook, you know, I hopped on Facebook for just a few minutes this morning and there are people um, complaining quite aggressively in their tone about um, what Christmas is gonna look like. Um, are we all gonna be forced to have a vaccination? So I think there was a sort of general theme and a general feel in society that became quite aggressive around you can't cage me you can't make me do these things I don't think that was as evident maybe in the first few weeks but I think the pushback started to kick in quite quickly we also had all of the protests around Black Lives Matter that happened throughout the summertime as well and whilst those were uh, politically, historically important messages that were coming through, it still looked at some level in some cases like things were becoming quite aggressive, um, either in response to what was happening or in the acts themselves. So I think there was, you know, it would be fair to say that our young people, they have mirror neurons in their brains, so they're looking at what's going on in the outside world and they reflect that. So I can understand how for them, you know, they were just mirroring in some part the frustrations that actually quite a lot of adults had and were expressing. 
Um, I think for our older young people, they became particularly frustrated because they go through a stage of wanting to break away from their family unit and to have more independence and to set up their own sort of social networks with their friends. Um, you know, that's part of their development. That's an important stage for them to go through. So for some of them, they were sort of denied the opportunity to do those things. And at the point when they most wanted to be away from their family, they were stuck with them. And at the point when they most wanted to be with their friends, they couldn't see them. Um, so I think that was certainly a factor in uh, some of that aggression coming through as well. Mm. And, and to what extent does the idea of fairness link to anger or aggression? I, it's definitely a factor. Um, it's not always necessarily a, uh, a clean cut um, it's unfair, therefore I'm going to get angry. Sometimes it's based around misunderstanding or misinformation. You know, something is unfair because you perceive it to be that way, not necessarily because it is. Um, and so going back to what we were saying about communication being so important, you know, I equally know a good handful of young people who kind of got it in terms of why lockdown was important, why it was that they weren't allowed to see their friends, because for them, the way in which uh, their parents and the people around them had taken responsibility for communicating what was going on in the world, and the fact that, you know, maybe we're doing this to protect granny, made them actually quite passionate about the fact that they wanted to stick to the rules. And so they saw the rules as being fair for that reason. Whereas other people, are you know potentially hearing the same stuff on the news and from the government but if they perceive that to be unfair then that's really going to be quite triggering for them um i've got one young person that i'm working with who when lockdown first came to an end and she went back to school was really frustrated with the fact that other people in her year group were not doing things like wearing their masks in the corridor. And, you know, just all of the rules that the school had put in, in place to keep them COVID safe as a result of going back. Um, and she obviously had just a very different perception. And I guess you could say a different set of values in relation to this uh, pandemic than other people that were the same age as her in the same year group as her, because, uh, it, you know, in a way they'd, perhaps received a different message from the people that were close to them. Mm. Yeah, and then it feels like double standards or hypocrisy or people yeah. creating a danger for for them and, and, and all the consequences of that. Um, we've heard a lot about anxiety in the media that, you know, people are worried. And, and I remember a, a few um, kind of newspapers spoke to me about um, this kind of idea of anxiety of people coming into the, the the mix what impact has the overall narrative of fear because obviously you know fear is is quite useful we see the scientists talking about the dangers and that's been one of the key ways in which the government have tried to influence behavior by using the fear of possible consequences or actual consequences to what extent does that have a different impact on children um for some it can uh, really create a heightened sense of anxiety. So we have seen some children who have developed um, almost like OCD type symptoms, particularly with things around hand washing and cleanliness, which were not there before. Um, and in some ways, that's when the messages that they're hearing are coming through low level you know it's the tv that's on in the background it's the radio that's playing when you're driving in the car and so they're not quite tuned into it at a level where you know they're sort of consciously thinking about it questioning it having conversations with the people around them it's just a sort of undercurrent of information that's coming in where it's easy then to misinterpret it or to become overly fearful about what they're hearing so there's definitely been an increase in those things um, I've also seen in my own therapy practice a rise in the number of young people particularly girls in this instance who are generally health fearful so I've seen more things like emetophobia which is the fear of being sick 
Um, and that has nothing to do with coronavirus. It's not that kind of an illness. And yet it's just, I think, something around the idea of being ill, which is getting installed in their minds. Um, equally, I've had another one who became super anxious about um, things that kind of implied illness, like the sound of her tummy rumbling and that drawing extra attention to her. And so skipping meals before going to class to try and avoid the sound of her tummy digesting food. Um, so I think there's been some of those anxieties, which again, were probably there before, but have certainly become escalated and we're seeing more instances of those occurring. Um, I think as well, there is, um, you know, there's fear related to the fact that at the moment we don't quite have the light at the end of the tunnel. We don't know when there will be a vaccine. We don't really know when all of this is ending. And, you know, anyone that I've spoken to in the last, uh, sort of since lockdown part two is saying, OK, well, we know that we're going to kind of get our freedom back ready for Christmas but you can bet your bottom dollar that we'll be back in lockdown again by January. And so young people are hearing those conversations. They probably even know that for themselves. So I think that heightens the levels of anxiety as well is quite often when you're faced with a fearful situation, you do at least know it's not gonna go on forever. Like I know when it's gonna to come to an end. And so you know you've got to cope with it right now, but you also know you're not gonna to have to cope with it later. Right now, we don't know when the light at the end of the tunnel is coming. So we don't really know when we're going to be sort of released from these fears and anxieties that we have. And, and I guess the unknown variable there of time actually adds to the anxiety, because if you're, I don't know, if you're in prison and you know that you've got a certain length of time, it's easier to kind of get your head around that. If you just know, well, you may never come out, that's going yeah. to create more anxiety than actually having the certainty of, right, there is an end date to this. Um, how do you use NLP to work on some of these issues? Because, you know, for the person listening right now, they might be familiar of, let's say, counseling or yep. um, CBT as a therapy approach. How is the way that you use NLP different? And, and what would someone working with you, let's say, with a child that, that is suffering with some kind of an issue, mm -hmm. how would they experience that? Um, well, one of the first things that I would say 99% of our practitioners do 99% of the time is once we've done a consultation session. So that's where we, we've got a very um, uh, set list of questions that we use and then we might throw additional ones in if necessary. But it really helps us to get our head around what's going on for that child in their model of the world um, and what, you know, essentially what the problem is that they're experiencing and where they wanna to get to once the problem's out of the way. Then we jump into something called the NLP communication model. Um, and this model is really useful for helping to describe how your thinking ends up delivering the results that you then end up getting. Um, and it's a really nice way to sort of break down all of that incoming information that we're bombarded with and looking at it and saying, well, you know, there's a lot going on outside there in the outside world. So how are you choosing the bits that you choose to focus on? And how are the bits that you're choosing maybe not the most helpful? And how might we then start going about changing it so that you can tune into some of the more pleasant aspects of life and start to feel differently and therefore create some different results for yourself, which is a really shorthand way of explaining the sort of intricacies that we go into. Um, I think as well, one of the key things that I always like to evaluate and address is that internal self-talk that we all have Young people have it too. They have certain ways of representing stuff to themselves inside their head. And that might relate to the content of what they're actually saying is maybe not too helpful. So they may be saying things like, this is terrible, it's gonna go on forever. And actually, whilst that may be, you know, a reasonable representation of what's going on in that moment, is probably not the most helpful one. So if we can just start to tweak that and change it a little bit, we don't go like full, you know, flipping in the opposite direction. One of the things that I'm quite passionate about is that we don't make NLP appear to just be happy clappy, let's just make everything positive, you know, because that doesn't work either. That's just lying to yourself. Whereas if you were to say to yourself, 
things are challenging at the moment and it will get better eventually. Like, that's okay. That's not super positive yet, but it's a shift in the right direction. We've got some hope in there. We've got some possibility in there. We've turned our problems into challenges, which makes us feel a bit more motivated and inspired. So I'll quite often evaluate some of that self-talk that they've got going on and suggest some small tweaks that feel digestible for them and easy for them to shift to that are ultimately going to take them away from wanting to hide under the duvet and actually sort of, you know, square up up a little bit put their shoulders back and step back out into the world somewhat um, the other thing is is that particularly around things like what we have going on at the, at the moment where we're not sure what the future is going to look like when we think about the future we sometimes have a habit of imagining worst case scenarios and by that i mean literally running a movie in your head of what might go horribly wrong now, the downside to doing that is it's a form of visual rehearsal. So you're actually kind of preparing yourself for that worst case scenario, even though it's not happened. And it might never happen in a million years, but you're still going to end up releasing all of the chemicals and hormones and emotions in your body that you would experience if that horribly wrong thing were to happen. And you're going to end up thinking in all of those negative ways that you would think if that horribly wrong thing were to happen. And so then it means that if at some point in the future, there's something which is a little bit similar to that thing going horribly wrong that does crop up in real life, you instantly know how to respond because you've been practicing it, which is not helpful. So I'll often look at what is it that they're doing in their head? Like, what are their disaster movies that they've got running in there? And again, it's not a, you know, 360 flip where we're going, okay, well, just imagine wonderful puppies and beautiful things instead, because that's too far from where they are at the moment. So initially, we want to just start making a small adjustment to what it is that they do, so that if they catch themselves indulging in that, it doesn't have the same negative ramifications for them. So that might mean that, for example, um, instead of seeing their disaster movie as if it's in like um, 4K, uh, high definition, surround sound, instead it's in black and white and it's got a pink fluffy frame around it. Like go for your life, see that disaster movie as much as you might possibly want to, but imagine that everybody's voice has gone two octaves up. Suddenly it doesn't carry the same meaning with it so you're not going to physically and internally react in the same way anymore. The other thing that we can do is we can look at those disaster movies and, and actually make them helpful for us by turning them into contingency plans, whereby we say, well, if that did happen, what would you do to correct the situation? How would you make it OK again? And then they go, yeah, but then this could happen in the disaster movie. And you go, well, if that did happen, what would you do to make it OK again? So then it, because, you know, the reality is life shows up. Sometimes bad things do happen in real life. So if we've already got the groundwork in place for knowing how to respond to that bad thing, if it did happen, then we already know how to correct our course and get ourselves back on the right track again. Hmm. So there's stuff like that that we do in our sessions, too. Yeah, and I guess it changes them from being the victim of the, you know, the disaster movie to the hero of the disaster movie. And 100%. They get to... Yeah, one of the things I always tend to say is, I don't care what happens by the end of this disaster movie, because it's only existing in your head anyway. So if you want to see yourself ripping off your clothes, and you've got Spider Man outfit on underneath, then don't let me stop you, because that's exactly what I would be doing. Mm, absolutely. And sometimes adults can be a bit resistant to making submodality shifts and things like that. Do you find that children are more happy to do that because it feels a bit more like a game? Yeah, definitely. It's definitely one of the benefits of working with children and young people is that they like to play. And adults can be a bit stuffy about doing those sorts of things. Um, and you maybe need to I don't know, proposition it to adults in a slightly different way to make it at times sound a bit more corporate for them so that it fits in better with their model of the world. Whereas with children, 
you know, quite often we'll say, when you come back for your next session, we're going to do some games or some activities together that are going to help you with your problem, which sounds like way more appealing for them than saying, you're going to come back and do a session of therapy with me and we're going to start some modalities intervention. Um, so yeah, we'll very often, you know, use those as opportunities to make it fun because I'm sure you know Adam as well if you if you've got someone who's in a bad state and you can make them laugh it is one of the single most like best pattern interrupts you can ever offer them um, and so we have a lot of laughter in our sessions and uh, and we you know bring the fun into it as much as we possibly can but and it's it's always a really good thing as well when like my office where I work is just out the back here and the parents waiting in the waiting area over here. When you come out and the parents like, like we could hear you laughing. We could hear you laughing so much during that session. And the child's coming out with a big smile on their face. And this is someone who's maybe been locked in their room for three weeks and uh, hasn't spoken to their parents for all of that time, apart from grunting every now and again. You know, when you start to, um, it just kind of get them coming out with that uh, that big smile on their face. Everybody else's expectations begin to change as well. And that's really important for working with young people is that sort of aspect with the parents, the carers, the teachers. We want them also feeling the shift because if they don't, we could have a child who has changed, but a parent who expects the same result and they end up bringing that child back to their old ways, not consciously, obviously, but um, you know, if they have an expectation that's nothing, nothing has changed, it's almost like by proxy, it will rub off on that child and it can undo the good work that you've done with them in a session. Whereas if we have a parent that goes like, wow, that's different, I haven't heard you laugh in ages, they're leaving going, something's got better. And then it holds that child to that standard of continuing to prove, yes, yeah, something has changed, something started to get better. Mm, it's that law of expectancy, isn't it? Um, obviously, you're very well trained in this area. So you see a child going through anger or anxiety, you have an idea, a model of, of dealing with that. If yeah. a parent's listening right now, what are some of the things that you do intuitively that they could kind of uh, learn from you as maybe tips to apply in their lives, in their family? Do you know what I think one of the most important basic things that you absolutely do not need to be trained in any way to be able to do is, I guess you might call it active listening. So I remember back in the day when I was nannying, before I was doing any of this stuff, I could really notice the difference when the parent had come home from work and had been working on the train on the way home versus when they had not. So if the parent had still been working on the train on the way home, by the time they walked in through the front door and they lived real close to the train station, their head was still in work mode. And so they come in and the kids would be like, like this, and the parent would talk to them and look at them, but it's like they were only half present. So they go, oh, that's great. Yeah, we had a really good day today. But you could tell they were still doing something else inside their head. Whereas if they had taken that time before they walked in through the front door to, I guess, like recenter themselves, ground themselves, whatever you want to call it, something that just means they are not in work zone anymore. Then when they came in through the front door, they were actually present and they could engage with their child and talk to them, sit down with them. And you could tell that they were really in that moment with them. So whatever that term is, whatever we want to call it for not just like being there, it's really focused, tuned in, listening and engaging. Then I think you've got a window of opportunity for almost kind of letting that young person know if you want to talk, I'm here to listen. Like my door is open. Um, and I think that's one of the most important things that, that they can do. Mm, yeah. Some people would call it mindfulness or conscious, you know, yeah. presence, whatever it might be, but it's, it's paying attention really. Um, if you're dusting off your crystal ball, uh, looking into 2021, what are some of the challenges that you might anticipate based on what we've seen this year that, that could, let's say, move over into the following year? Um, I think that 
uh, there's obviously a chance next year that the conversation will shift more towards vaccinations. So I think there's going to be some anxieties related to that, whether those are anxieties around the impact of vaccinations. I think we're going to suddenly see a surge in, you know, there are plenty of young people, I'm sure, who have issues around going to have an injection when it's time for immunisations. Nobody particularly enjoys the experience, but it's not necessarily something that right now would force them to come and see someone like me. I think that might change because I think there is so much hype around COVID and so much hype around the vaccine. Um, I would anticipate we're going to have a, a cluster of those sorts of clients coming through. Um, I think that come January, we will probably, we generally get a bit of a spike in referrals in January anyway, because the Christmas holidays is one of those where you are solidly with your family you know children aren't really going into kids camp through the christmas holidays um and uh, maybe less families are sort of going away and and having those sorts of experiences so we often see that a bit like that first lockdown that families have suddenly got a very intense period together where they can't get away from each other and quite often uh, Christmas is a bit of a microcosm of what happened in that first lockdown. So then we end up getting quite a lot of calls in the new year. Um, I think that we'll probably have that again in the new year where, um, you know, parents are just kind of looking at their children and, and kind of saying they are not reacting, behaving, responding in a way that I might like them to, um, you know, maybe feeling like their grip is slipping a little bit. Um, and I think that, you know, Christmas is another school holiday. Hmm. So there may well be another spike in the school refusal coming up um, again for January. Interesting. And if a parent's listening right now and they feel like they could do with some additional support or help um, with some of the issues raised in, in this chat, um, what's the best way that they can connect with you? And for those parents that are worried that they might not be able to afford let's say a therapist are there any alternative ways that they could still deal with these kind of issues but in a way that isn't going to break the bank yeah absolutely so um social media wise you can find us everywhere so we're on facebook twitter linkedin instagram all of that jazz um we've obviously got the main nlp for kids website which is nlp with a numerical four and then kidskids.org um there's actually tons of resources on the website itself uh so we've got things like articles on there so if you're looking for like completely freebie stuff there's a page of products where we've got some freebies and some uh, top tips and things that parents can download we've got a new article that goes out every single month with ideas and tips in there we have two videos that go onto our youtube channel every month one is specifically for parents and professionals one is actually for children and young people if you want to put them in front of something meaningful on, on youtube for a change um so there's a load of stuff that is just like readily accessible for people um we also have which is quite new our parents and professionals membership platform so we have schools that have joined the platform where every single member of staff in the school has access and then we have individuals such as parents who have joined up to the platform too um, and in there we've got things like um, interviews with our practitioners around issues such as uh, bereavement, anger, school refusal, um, we've got uh, again we've got videos in there specifically for parents and professionals, we also within the NLP for kids team on a monthly basis do a live webinar where we examine a particular case study so it's a specific issue that a family have experienced and that gets recorded and also put into our parents and professionals membership area so if there's anyone who's kind of thinking of even dabbling from a training perspective there's actually materials in there to support that too and then we've got some of the bare bone basics like your star charts and reward plans and games that you can play at home that sort of carry specific um, helpful meaning posters that you can download um, and that is 6.99 a month so it's less than a Netflix subscription. Um, so that one's definitely worth a look. Fantastic. You've got some really interesting uh, tips and advice there, Gemma, and thank you so much for being on the show today. 
thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And to you at home. Thanks for joining me on Modern Mindset. See you again soon for more.